All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Conversation for Thursday. No, Context and Clarity Live. <laughs> Welcome. It's Thursday, August 18th. Sorry about that. Uh, if you just joined us, say hi. Let us know that you're here. Let us know where here is for you. Where are you joining this conversation from? We've never met before. My name is Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis. I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays. I'm joined by Catherine McPhail from Massachusetts. Welcome, Catherine. Hi, Jeff. Glad that glad you're here with me today. Hopefully, you can keep it on the rails better than what I've already done. So we'll see how this no goes. Pressure. Yep, I'll try. And, uh, <laughs> it'll be fine. It'll all be fine. Uh, hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, the reason we come here every weekday afternoon is so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. It doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you said, hey, 2022 is my year and I'm going to start my own thing. And you're on the runway to starting that thing before the end of the year. It's mid-August. You've got a few months left to do something here. We're rooting mm -hmm. for you. Maybe you have owned your own firm for a year or nine years or... 17 years, and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture, and they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, I see Chris Novelli first on my screen. He's over in Massachusetts. Welcome, Chris. Uh, that means Chris being first in to the room means that he's the winner of today's John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award. So congratulations, Chris. Glad you're there. Uh, Scott Thrift is over on LinkedIn. He says, happy Thursday from San Francisco. Welcome back, Scott. And Ed Shannon from Des Moines, Iowa. Mm. Some people call it Des Moines. Um, welcome back, Ed. And uh, Jessica says, she's not sure how it's Thursday already. I'm not either. Me neither. I, well, I, actually, I do know. Yeah, I've been procrastinating on a really big deadline, so that means that so time is accelerating. We can thank and, you for that, Jeff, because I don't know yep. how it got to be Thursday either. Yep. Sorry about that. That's that's on me. <laughs> that's all right. Class okay. starts Tuesday. It'll decelerate soon. Uh, <laughs> she, she, she told Chris he needs to figure out that Concord jet strategy. We, when were we, we were talking about that during, I think, a Meet the Speaker uh, interview earlier this week, maybe. Uh, Barry Reed, welcome back from soggy Scotland. Good evening to you, sir. Hopefully you have a drink that matches the sogginess or at least offsets the sogginess. Ed says, um, he's replying, Ed's replying to Ed. That's weird. It says that there on the screen. Ed is talking to himself. He says, hello from the great Midwest. <laughs> Chris is still crunching the numbers on the, uh, the Concord scheme there. Nicole, welcome back from Arizona. And James Petty, he's over there on YouTube. Welcome back from upstate New York, James Petty. Let's see. Chris says Scott typed too much. He's got to keep the first one short in order for the win. So there's this whole strategy that goes on uh, to be the first person in the room because the first person yeah. in the room wins the coveted, the highly coveted John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award. This has been a competition for uh, yeah. two and a half years now. Um, Chris is doing well. Scott's doing well. But there's some definite strateg strategization going on, strategizing. Yeah. I think I made up a word. Strategization. Some strategizing going on there. Strategization. Strate strategy, maybe. But anyway, yeah, uh, I haven't gotten one in a long time. <laughs> that's the penalty for being here with me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. But maybe that's why I haven't gotten you right. There are a lot of people that want to know, how could I get Catherine's seat? You know, having Catherine's really? seat, being my co-host. Hmm. There's there's no award for that. There ought to be. There ought to be a big award for that. I think I think there's it's no its bonus own for that. It's its own award, I think, Jeff. Yeah, oh yeah. There's there's something yeah. crocheted going on there, definitely. <laughs> but in a way, it's a crocheted penalty, I think. No, uh, so it's, sorry it's about fun. That. It's fun. So I, I have a question though. This is a dumb question. You yeah. ready? We're gonna kick it off with an easy one. What does there's crunching no numbers that... even mean? What does that mean? Does that mean like well, you're adding okay. up numbers to see how much it's gonna cost for the jet? Does that mean like you're changing numbers to make it work? I mean, how does crunching come in? Maybe that's a good question or a bad question for Meg. I bet she knows the answer to that. Well, are numbers really crunchy? Right, exactly. Are they crunchy? 
I heard old aortas are crunchy. That's really disgusting. I'm sorry I brought that up. <laughs> okay. What am I talking about? Let's bring let's bring on the guests. So stop. It's almost like we're talking numbers about cereal crunchy. all of a sudden. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what crunching numbers comes from, what it means. I don't when people say you gotta crunch the numbers. I don't know what that means. Well, uh, we, we might be able to figure to that out. We might be that. able to figure that out today. I think it just means um, up. Yeah, I think we've got the right guest for this. We're, we're going to figure this out. Chris says math is math. Yeah, we were talking about that on Clubhouse this morning. Um, Rod, welcome back from Louisiana. He says it's soggy there too. And uh, Christian's joining us from Ithaca, New York. Let's see, Jessica says, I think it's a sound your brain makes while trying to figure out math, especially if it's common core math. But that's that's a whole other We don't discussion. need to know what that is. No, we don't. We're not going down that rabbit hole today. No. Um, if you are over, if you're joining us over from Facebook, if you're joining us from Facebook, right now you're probably commenting away going, what in the world are you guys talking about and why? Um, but your your comments are not showing up on the screen. It's because you are in a private group inside of Facebook. Facebook has these rules, these privacy policies. They don't let your comments or your name or your likeness out. Um so if you're commenting away, your comments aren't showing up on the screen and you'd like them to, there is a URL at the bottom left of the screen right now. It's chat.restream.io slash FB, just like Facebook. Type that into your browser window and a couple of clicks later, you can give Facebook permission to let that information out to Restream, which is this platform that we have here that we use here for these interviews, these conversations, and that will solve all of your problems. You will understand what crunching numbers means. You'll understand a lot of things um, if you just type that into your browser window, chat.restream.io slash FB, like Facebook. So uh, give that a shot if you're over there on Facebook commenting away and nothing seems to be happening here on the screen. Uh, Adam Steiner, welcome. Howdy from Valparaiso, Indiana. Hi, Adam. Glad to have you back here. There's a connection between Adam Steiner and today's guest, by the way. Just throwing mm. that out there. Um, yeah, I've been rambling on, lost my place a few minutes. In the meantime, we have a special treat in the green room today that our guest is in, certainly enjoying. It's M&M ice cream Ooh. in the green room today. Nice. Um, but we've got to be careful. We've got to uh, bring them out before it all gets eaten or melted or whatever is happening back there. I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> with that... Let me introduce our guest today. Our guest is a number tamer, maybe a number cruncher, I don't know, a number, number tamer. tamer that sees the future and creates light bulb moments for her clients. Mm. She's the anti-accountant whose superpowers begin where financial statements end. She's a virtual CFO, the author of the ebook, Getting Your Numbers Right, and the creator of Hiring for Profit. Megan Dolly, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Hi. Hi. Yeah, the ice cream. Sorry, I didn't save any for you. It's <laughs> There goes the after party. I don't know what we're going to do now. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that the ice cream was delivered in its frozen form all the way to San, or South Dakota in time for our conversation today. Yeah, and no, no raisins. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now everybody knows exactly what we were talking about in the uh, be before we went live here: ice cream, raisins, the, all the important things. <laughs> Nachos. <laughs> Nachos. <laughs> and and buffaloes, but we won't get into that. Um, great to have you here. I know that you have a fan club here. Um, uh, fan Megan club or is, trolls? We we have yet to decide, right? <laughs> well, we're, we're going to figure that out. All right, we're going to figure that out as we go. <laughs> Megan is no stranger to the Entre Architect community. She's part of the Architects and Allies Mastermind Group, and so um, I expect some of the uh, the folks from the Mastermind Group. I already I know <laughs> some. I know some of who is in that group, and they're here already, ready to represent. So. Um, it's great to have them here. It's obviously great to have you here. So thanks a lot for joining us today for a conversation about our firm finances. Well, this is my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is this is going to be a blast. <laughs> I, I think it is. <laughs> Greg is already volunteering that he's definitely a troll. So Okay, now, now what do I do? Because I'm supposed to get rid of trolls, so I am conflicted. Well... <laughs> 
it's I guess as long as it's appropriate, we can leave the trolls in the in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, Megan, as I was thinking about what we would talk about today, and, and for those of you that are not familiar, context and clarity is a conversation that we have every every day, every weekday. And the way that we map out our week is basically we say, hey, we're going to talk with Megan on Thursday for context and clarity live. We're going to talk about finances. Um, so we're going to we're going to shape our entire week around talking about the finances for our businesses somehow. It's one question every single day. So we've we've talked about um, knowing how much work we need. We've talked about the financial numbers that you track or you don't track or you should track. Uh, we've talked about knowing um, knowing if we can afford to hire somebody or if we can afford not to hire somebody or, you know, those, those types of things. And so as, as I was thinking about this conversation today, I'm like, yeah, I want to know along those lines, how much can I pay myself? Um, how do I make more profit and how do I know when and if, you know, so on and so forth, I can hire the help that I need. But maybe we need to take half a step back and say, what, what are the things that we really need to be thinking about in terms of our business that lead up to these conversations? Does that make sense? What, why, why are these numbers important to begin with, I guess? Absolutely. And there's a certain order of operations questions that I ask my clients. You know, And the first one is actually, like, what do you want? What do you need? And I'm not talking like in terms of your business or anything, but I, I've come across too many times people overshoot, right? Like they they lose track of what they actually need and want in their business or in their in their personal life. And then they get wrapped up in the everything else in the business. It's got to be bigger. It's got to be more. It's got to da 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 And like we've overshot and we're working too hard for things that, oh yeah, that's that's not that's not where I was. So the first step is what do you want and what do you need? And let's back into what's going on now, right? There's a reconciliation between that and the status quo. I kind of find my, okay. Between the status quo and what do I want and need? Um, so like the, the numbers help tell the story and, and without like, <laughs> we got to find the focus on the right thing first, like set that, that stone in the ground, that touchstone that you can always come back to and be like, oh yeah, that's right. I don't have to do this thing. I want to do it because I enjoy it. What would be an example of something that people want or need? You mean, are you talking about like paying for a wedding or going yeah. on a trip or stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually start with what I call three-dimensional goals because people are always like, this is how much I want. You know, this is what I want to do. This is when I want to do it. And they manifest and they think about it in the things. But the part that people lose track of is like, when, how much money do you need and when, and can we protect that along the way? So it doesn't just magically appear in two years, but you are purposefully making money towards that, protecting the cash towards that particular goal along the way. So it doesn't become two years from now and like, oh, I'm just going to push that deadline out a little bit farther. So it's having a holistic approach. What do I want for my business? What I actually want to be doing? What is it producing for me and my family personally and the change that I want to make in the world? And not just more profit, more profit, more profit, work, work, bigger, bigger, more employees, more work, 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 work. I love that. I mean, I think I think that really resonates, as, as you know. But I, th I think this really resonates with our community, which is primarily small firm architects, um, because you know you you said you talked about numbers telling the story, and I think it. Chris's comment earlier, math is math, right? When we were joking about that, that's a reference back to we were talking about Common Core math on Clubhouse this morning. Math is math but you're talking about giving meaning to these numbers. And I love that because many of the businesses that are represented in our audience were started for a reason, right? That has to do probably with family, a lifestyle, um, freedom, you know, all, all, all sorts of, all sorts of reasons. But I love the fact that, you know, like, um, like you say, you know, your, your magic starts where the, the financial statement ends, there's more to it that we've got to pay attention to the numbers. Absolutely. We've got to know and numbers. 
it's like a backstory. Like your financial statements tell you everything that's happened up to today. And math is math, sure, unless you're like Enron or WorldCom. But um, it, it, <laughs> it puts everything in its tidy little spot, right? Like, and I can see it's an, it's an organization system. It's a Marie Kondo for for what's been going on, and you can organize it however you want to. But a prequel isn't the movie, right? It's all of that future stuff of how is this going to work out, getting rid of that discomfort and having a plan for that next step that gets you toward an actual goal, not just an arbitrary, because this is the way it's always been. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I love I love the movie analogies too. <laughs> that really helps us understand. So when, um, when you start working with a client, small firm architect, interior designer, um, building designer and, and, and contractor, what's, what's the first step? And, and I know it, there's probably, and it depends, but, but where do, where do we begin the process of figuring these things out? Where are you? Status quo. What's, what's been going on? What's on your mind? What's, what's been stressing you out? What's, what are you worried about? Um, a lot of people are scared that the, the train is coming to hit them, right? Um, they don't know when. They don't know if for sure that it's actually coming, but there's that fear in the back of their head that I'm not going to be able to pay my staff. I'm not going to be like, I'm doing this wrong. There's something that I don't know that I can't see and everybody else knows it and I don't. Um, and so we just need to figure out where you're at, right? Like, is are your books in order? If not, we need to clean them up so we can we can see what's going on. But then truly the next step is, okay, this is where you're at. And now where is it that you want to be? And we need to reconcile the two. What are the levers that can get you there? So truly, what do you want? Is your business capable of doing that, right? That's the next step of this is the trends that you've been having. This is what you have in your pipeline. This is what you have going, the new ideas that you want to try, all of the things. Is that going to get you towards your goal? Is it capable? If we map out all of that cash, give all of your money a job for the next 12 months, is that going to get us there? And hopefully, yes. Hopefully the answer is yes. And if not, are there levers to pull? And sometimes if the answer is no, and I don't want it to, that's okay too. But that's a really good indicator that we can shift gears now and we don't have to wait for the train to hit. Yeah. And so then the last part, (laughs) we'd rather not have the train hit. And then the last part I've started recently integrating the last six months with my clients are what are the boundaries? Like, what are you willing to do and not willing to do? I'm willing to do two revisions and everything after that is going to be for a fee. I'm willing to start tracking my time to make sure that this project really is a hundred hour project and not a 400 hour project. Well, it's usually more than you, you assume. So what are those limitations? And that's when you really get to step into being able to tell your clients the truth face on, right? You don't have to dance around it. Um, facing some ugly truths maybe with your family and you don't have to dance around it with your vendors if that's the case. And like, yep, this is the way it is. And having that objective look at things without the ugh, angst and grossness that can come along with the not knowing the train's coming. Should I, should I be looking for that? Is it coming? Is it coming for me? (laughs) I mean, you mentioned angst and, you know, according to the screen right now, there's about 20 people in this conversation right now, plus the the three of us here on screen. I imagine that 18 of those people have some angst around finances. Absolutely. Just guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The most common reaction I get is tears. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) With with new conversations. And it's just the relief that people have somebody to talk to about these things that they really didn't want to talk to. It's like taking your clothes off in front of a stranger. You know, it's, it's, (laughs) there's some pretty personal stuff that comes with it. A lot of self-judgment that comes along with opening up your books to somebody else and asking for help. Um, But there's some miraculous things that come out of this. I mean, I've seen some pretty brave steps that even make me tear up when I think about some of these things that some business owners have done when they just stepped up and owned where they were at and did something about it. John Jones says, if you make him cry, if you make someone cry, you win. (laughs) (laughs) John's going to be the next target. (laughs) (laughs) You're next. (laughs) In the next 35 minutes, we're going to make John Jones cry. (laughs) That's uh, that's not the goal. No, well, that we already did that a few months ago. <laughs> <laughs> What's um, his name? 
a, a few minutes ago, you mentioned, you, you talked about, I forget exactly how you said it. You talked about money having a job. Yeah. Um, what is What does that mean exactly? Uh, board money is wasted money, right? So if you get a big job that comes in and you're looking at it and thinking of all these cool things that you're going to be doing with this money, um, you're probably doubling up on a few jobs. That dollar bill is probably given two or three different jobs when you're sitting and dreaming about th this, this job that's going to be coming in. And so we actually want to assign each one of those dollars Okay, you are for owner pay, you are for bonuses, you are for paying that vendor um, long before it comes in the door. Um, I recently had an experience, lesson learned, more boundaries, boundaries, all these lessons are uh, lessons and boundaries. Um, a client I never should have taken, it was a favor for a friend, all of the things, and I ended up losing like $13,000, and that $13,000 had a job. It had a job to do. And so when I realized that I was not going to get paid for my work, it's like, okay, so if those jobs aren't covered by that money, what's next? Like, how, where do I go get it? Do I need to go get it? Is that a job that needs to be filled? Um, and what it looks like in real life. Okay, I'll give, give you some solid, like, what it looks like. It's a spreadsheet because everything in my life is a spreadsheet because they're sexy. <laughs> I can see everything. So I have... All of my money coming in for the next 12 months, I have it what's solid, what's projected, what I hope to do, new projects. I have all my money going out, giving it a job inside the business, but also the job of paying taxes, the job of paying my family, the job of my top three goals and how I'm saving for those and, and hiding the money. So it actually has an assignment. This is what you're going to be used for before it ever comes in the door. When I wasn't doing that, uh, it was pretty embarrassing to call myself an accountant <laughs> and then have the money problems that I did. My money needed a job. Hmm. So, so is that then the basis of your tracking system? The, yeah. The, um, every like, so dollar I, having a job? Yep. Yeah, profit first is part of that, right? Like, like profit first is a great job of profit, owner pay, tax, operating expenses. That's that's where this money is going. But it also ties into those having the goals, going back to what is this actually for? Um, I, I give the example of, I have a friend who lives down in Arizona. She's lived there for like seven, 11 years now. And she keeps saying, I'm going to move back home. I'm going to move back home in three years. In three years, I'm moving back home. She's never going to move back home. It's not going to happen because she doesn't protect the progress of of actually making the move. She says three years because that's how long it would take to save up that money. Well, if you're not actually putting that aside, I see it on my sheet. I know where to go put that money. So it's not even tempting anymore. So it's like uh, profit first on steroids. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. 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 So if, if you're joining us, if you're listening in on this conversation, first of all, welcome. Glad you have joined us for this Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live with Megan Dolly. Um, Megan has mentioned Profit First a couple of times in the in the last minute or so. Um, if you're not familiar, that's a book by Mike Michalowicz. Mike Michalowicz has been a guest on Context and Clarity Live now twice. Um, and I say this not, not to fanboy too much, but there's not a Mike Michalowicz book that you shouldn't read. Um, Mike's, in my opinion, Mike's superpower is taking complex business problems, distilling them down into their most simple form and developing simple systems to solve those business problems. Profit First is exactly what it sounds like. It's about taking the money for profit first. Profit's not a bad thing. You know, we could, we could obviously dig into that, but uh, it is definitely a book that is... Um, is worth investing in, not only yeah. in purchasing it, but reading it and implementing it. So, or listening um, to it. Mike does a great job on the to audio it. book too. Oh, he does. Yeah, he does. yeah. yeah I like it. <laughs> the bumpers. Yeah, it's like it's like bumpers. It's like having that built-in, um, instant, instant look at your books and making sure that I'm okay for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, that the. the um, when you're, when you're, I, I, you know, I'm stuck on the every, uh, every dollar has a job idea. Um, again, as I said at the beginning, I, I think the three big questions that we hear a lot in our community is how much should I pay myself or how much can I pay myself? Because there are a lot of people again, that started their firm as a sole practitioner. Maybe they're still a sole practitioner and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, maybe they have 
seven people or 15 people or whatever. Um, but they started for a reason. And I know there's some of us that are still going, I, I've been doing this for a while and I don't know how much I should be paying myself. That can get into the fees that I'm charging and all of these things. Right. Um, I don't know if this is worth it because I don't feel like I'm paying myself enough. When we run it, when you run into situations like that with your clients, what do you talk about? What do you do? How do you help them understand what they can or should be, or uh, what they need to do to pay themselves what they what they think they need? Yeah, should is should is a tough question. Should is a tough word. Um, yeah, I. I lean so heavily on the cash projection, whether it's like the the three month is easier than like the six month gets a little liquid and 12 months is kind of like, but it's, but it's a plan. Um, So I have to take into account your affinity for risk, right? I personally can't function without knowing that I have three months of pay sitting in a bank account somewhere that I can pay myself for three months. And from there, I can adjust. Like when I see that account growing, I can give myself a raise, right? And so when I know what work is coming in, I know what my backlog is, who I'm going to be billing and who I'm going to be paying, um, we can start moving things around and massaging things a little bit. Like, well, if I did this, would I be able to pay myself more? Or actually, I really want to do this other thing and I am willing to pay myself less to run this experiment. I love running experiments. Experiments are my favorite thing. Well, I have a lot of favorite things like ice cream, but, and nachos, but um, yeah, I want to know, like, what am I willing to give up in order to do a thing? And if I can see all of my resources in one spot, I can make an educated decision on what I can pay myself rather than a, well, I think I deserve it. And I'm going to, it doesn't matter how I'm going to, if I hurt my company, I just, I'm going to take it because I can, and I'm just going to close my eyes and hope that it works out for the best in the future. Like, don't look, don't look. Maybe I accelerated that train a little bit, but I don't care. I wanted it. I needed it. Um, so it's really holistic. You got to look. Um, and once you have that all laid out, like knowing where to go f- dig up more cash, what are your options for digging up more cash or burying more expenses? Can you take the time curve, like the, the money curve, if it's on a chart and push out the expenses and accelerate the revenue coming in. And what would that do for the future? Does that hurt you in the future? Do you have things that are lining up behind you already? That's going to make that okay. So it's a tough question to answer without like digging into your individual Mm -hmm. spreadsheet, your cash forecast and seeing what's going on behind the scenes there and knowing you're okay taking a risk or, you know what, I'd feel much safer if it, if I had six months worth of expenses sitting there first. Hmm. Six months. I have never, ever had six months of expenses uh, or even three. I just <laughs> wing it every single day. Um, how, so when you talk about experiments, what kind of experiment do you mean? Oh, like marketing experiments or hiring yeah. experiments or um, a new product line, new way of serving your client type experiments. Um, so many, there's mm-hmm. so many people lining up to take your money and run experiments in your business. Let me tell yeah, you. Yeah, that is so, true. That is true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we okay. want to cherry pick them before, before we, we choose one. It would seem like the cash projections would be the easy thing because it's not real. You just make it up. Isn't that easier? Uh, you can. I prefer we don't just like pull things out of thin air. Um, and that's one of my things. I'm, I'm a cheerleader, right? Like I, I love my clients and I'm rooting for them to do their best. And when they tell me that they have five half million dollar projects lined up in the next three months, my 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 I have a little note written to myself that says, slow down, slow down. Like, okay, we need to look at the probability of each one of these and what happens if only one comes in? What happens if three come in? And what are the contingency factors for each one? What happens if all five come in? Does that mean that we need to start hiring? Um, but just be being aware of what the future could look like under different routes is so helpful and so soothing. Mm. Soothing. Well, I, think I don't that's... know if that's the word I would use, but... <laughs> Well, it, try it. if it if it gives you <laughs> if that understanding gives you comfort, is it soothing? So I once had a client, and this is this is the one that makes me cry. And she was from rural, rural town, small, small town. Um, 
And she had a warehouse, she had a studio, she had an employee, and she was pretty much working to pay her employee and not being able to pay herself. And she was had dug herself such a deep hole that she couldn't even see the light. She didn't know what direction her shovel was facing. Um, and when she came to me, like the, it was like caught in my throat telling her, you have to sell your warehouse. You have to fire her employee, he who happened to be her sister. Mm-hmm. And um, she was going through breast cancer treatments at the time. But that was the direction of the light. We had to get some of those liabilities off the balance, some of those cash ob- obligations just it wasn't sustainable. And so it was keep digging and we're going to find ourselves in bankruptcy in six months. And what happened is that she did it. I mean, she did it. Could you imagine living in the small town where everybody knows all of your business and you have to wave the white flag and Mm -hmm. sell it and fire your sister? Who's going through breast cancer treatments? Why going through breast cancer treatments? Well, is it was the woman herself going through breast cancer yeah. treatments? Oh, okay. I thought her sister yeah. was, which makes it a little bit that yeah, a little, little bit, bit better. Worse. But she did it. And six months later, her business was thriving. It was mm. thriving because she was able to let go of all of the th- all of the shoulds and the oppression of having it like predetermined for her what her business had to look like. And once we lifted the veil of you can go outside this box. It doesn't have to be like this. You don't have to just do more more and more of the same to try to get ahead. Like once the oppression of what you should and people think you ought to do is gone, you get this freedom to experiment with, well, what actually could be instead. Hmm. Yeah. I, going back to what you were saying in the beginning, you know, the reason that you're, what's the reason what you know what is it that you're trying to accomplish here as a starting point and then as you just said looking at things holistically because i you know again i'm i'm not throwing anybody under the bus i include myself in in probably all all of these criticisms or all all of these examples um i think there are a lot of us that are along for a ride Uh, I i was we were talking before we got started about podcasts and things and I was listening to one this morning, as I told you, and it inspired me to go through and cancel two two SaaS products that I had that I was not getting the ROI that I, this is directly out of the, the podcast interview. I, I canceled two of them today because I'm paying, you know, whatever, whatever it was. I don't even know what I was paying, honestly, um, but I was getting little to no return on investment. Obviously, is isn't matching what I was paying. And so I canceled them. And, you know, you were talking about digging, digging up money and burying expenses, um, which reminds me, my, my wife's grandma used to live around the corner from us, one of them. And after she passed away, we found out that she had coffee cans of, of money buried in the backyard. That's not what you're talking about. Mm. Um, <laughs> but, but I was, I guess I was uh, getting rid of some of those expenses today by canceling those things. But I think it can be really hard. You know, I think that's a great example. You sell the warehouse in a small town, all of those things. Um, There are a lot of us that are attached to a lot of things. One of those SaaS softwares I was really attached to. What is a SaaS software? uh, uh, Software as a service. Sorry, it's all those subscriptions that you have. It's Hmm. your... It's your email marketing. It's your CRM. It's it's your Autodesk product. it's, um, It's all of those things. Uh, there are a lot of us, I think, that are wrapped up in a lot of these expenses, whether it's software or something else. You go, mm-hmm. well, I've got to have that subscription, right? This is what I do. I've got to have that subscription. And as you pointed out in that podcast interview, and and as you're talking about now, did I really? No, I just canceled two. Um, do we really need to do this because of the status quo or because this is what architects do or or have, or things like that. Um, These, these are hard decisions and and hard topics, but I love the fact that this is exactly what you bring up. Yeah. I don't think, um, 
especially when it comes to SAS, those are, those are such great low hanging fruit. It's that 72 hours of pain, kind of like a uh, letting go of an employee. That's the 72 hours of pain leading up to it. Then you do it and then you kind of forget that you did it and like, oh yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Things I'm still alive. Things are still functioning. Nothing's falling through the cracks. I'm alive. Yeah. It's good mm. to be alive. <laughs> it's good to be alive. <laughs> It's good to be alive. Yeah. Sometimes naming the fear, right? Um, I was taught this exercise by Aaron File. It happened like right before COVID became a thing. And thank goodness I learned this right before she did or before it hit because it, it like it, I was, I was trembling. Like what is going to happen to us? My husband's a teacher. That's fine. But he's a teacher in South Dakota. And how are we ever going to pay for our mortgage? Where are we going to do groceries? Where are we going to be destitute? And the exercise was to name 50 good things that would happen if the bad thing didn't happen. So if I were to go bankrupt, what were 50 good things that would actually happen? And let me tell you, the first 10 were really hard to come up with. The next 10 were okay. And the next 30, like bang, bang, bang. My husband came home that day and I was like, we're going to declare bankruptcy and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Granted, we never had to or anything, but but it was really good to like get me out of this wallowing what if, what if, what if. I was safe. I was fed. I had a roof over my head. I have a happy, healthy family. Like I was so down in the dumps about what could be in the future that wasn't even a reality yet that I needed something to shake me out of it. And it was fantastic. It was a really wow. great exercise. So can I just make sure I wrote that down correctly? So name 50 good things that would happen if the bad thing happens. Yes. Yes. That wouldn't right. otherwise happen. Ah, uh, that wouldn't otherwise happen. That wouldn't so, otherwise happen. Am I, do you mind if I ask for an example on that? If you uh, yeah, sure. So I, um, student loan, there, there are ways to get rid of your student loan through bankruptcy and like I, I could have it gone. I could have it gone. And in seven years, like that's off of my record. Like it could be gone. I wouldn't have to pay that stupid check every month anymore. It'd be gone. Um, like we'd have a yep. chance at a different house. Great. Granted, I love this house and everything, but maybe there's something else that's better out there later. Right. Maybe, maybe we're too tied to a community where we all of a sudden could live wherever we wanted to, because we, uh, what's, there's nothing because you're, cause you're homeless, so you don't Starting you're not tied homeless. down. We right. could go anywhere. Courage we could go real. anywhere. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. see. I see where you're going with that. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's an incredible. That, that's an incredible exercise. You know, as I think more about it, there there is. Uh, I I love. I, I'm not a I'm not a scientist. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I love st studying neuroscience, especially as it relates to branding and marketing, which is my corner of the world. Um, and there is. Uh, there, there are studies on the neuroscience side that talk about the fact that simply naming the fear, saying it out loud, mm -hmm. allows your brain to move it from one part of the brain to another part of the brain and actually feel some, some relief and satisfaction simply by saying, you know, whatever that, that fear is. Hey, I think I we're, like that. I think we're going to be, have to file bankruptcy. Your brain actually responds positively to that, which seems kind of bizarre, but I think it's probably in the realm of that exercise. Now yeah. that I think about it. Yeah. That's kind of fun. And even thinking of it now, I'm like, what would happen if we could just leave town? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> um, well, Christian, Christian and I actually <clears throat> also want to know what's the first thing we need to do so we can afford to hire a virtual CFO. Uh, well, like, why? Why? Why would you want to hire a CFO? That's the first question. Like, what is the outcome that you want out of it? Um, and have that, like, articulate that outcome. And when you are talking to virtual CFOs, like, this is my primary reason why I'd like to hire you. Is this a result that, that you can help me with? And is that ROI worth it, right? They're going to name a price for you. Um, it might be less than you are imagining. Um, so, you need to know ahead of time what it is worth to you so that you're not talked into anything necessarily that you might not need or that the outcome that you're looking for would actually be better served by a bookkeeper or your outcome would actually be better served by an executive coach or an executive assistant or that type of thing. Um, that's what you're looking for. Hmm. 
let's pause there for a second. What's what's the difference between a bookkeeper and a CFO? So just so we know. Yep. So forward. CFO, think of it on a timeline, right? Like if this is today and this is everything historical, like your bookkeeper is your Marie Kondo. She's putting everything in the right spot, making it all shiny right? And you get your financial statements, which that's a whole nother conversation about why they're a little bit useless. You get your financial statements, you get your income statement, your balance sheet, cash flow, whatever, APAR. What's missing, what people like stay up about at night is that future looking, I want to try this experiment. I want to do this thing. I want to pay myself. I want to hire, but I'm not sure how all these different levers are going to work together. I want a better understanding of what's coming down the road for me in my business. I want to be able to see it and plan for it. Um, so your CFO is going to be able to like find all of the resources and put them all in a format that you can see and read and start looking at three months, six months, 12 months down the road. And so, th- so thank you for that. And I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, and so you were, you were talking about, figuring out what you wanted to get out of it, what the ROI is out of it. Um, and and then somebody, virtual CFO, yeah. is going to name a price. Yeah, so there's, there's different methods of working um, with CFOs. Uh, I, for one, work like I, I do a very intense front-loaded month with my clients um, because I want to know all, all the secrets, all the dead bodies, where they're buried. I want to know everything. And so that's a little bit more intense. And then it, sometimes it turns out that um, just coming back once a quarter, once every six months, once at the end of the year is good enough. Sometimes they want that hand-holding of every month, which, you know, I'm – extremely sensitive. And I think you'll find this with most people in accounting, they're extremely sensitive to the cash position of their clients, right? They're not going to do anything to ever harm their clients. I would hope that they would never do anything to harm their clients. And we would know better than anybody by looking at it and saying, "Mm, you know what, actually, I think you'd be better off going in and really concentrating on your marketing right now or developing your skills on retaining your clients and keeping them happy. (laughs) <laughs> That's another thing that I find uh, fascinating about what you do. Again, with the connection to Profit First, um, and, and for those of you that know Mike Michalowicz, you've got Profit First, and then you've got Fix This Next, which I think um, really kind of gets into this conversation as as well as you're you're talking. You're not. You you just kind of whispered basically that the, you know the financial <laughs> statements are aren't uh, all they're made out to be necessarily, but um, you're talking about more than numbers, right? You're, you're looking at a very holistic. Um, I guess it could all be boiled down to numbers, but but maybe you need to concentrate on your marketing, like you said. Maybe you need to do this or that. Um, Janine says a bookkeeper is like a builder. The CFO is like the architect. <laughs> There's a nice analogy there. I love Janine. Um, She's great. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a uh, there's a family connection in the audience. All of a sudden, um, the um, um, looking at things holistically again. How much can I pay myself? How much mm-hmm. should I pay myself? Which should is a hard word. How do I make more profit? How um, how do I know when I can afford to hire somebody? And like we've granted like the CFO isn't going to hand you these answers, right? Yeah. They are going to give you the perspective, the more objective perspective so you can see all of the moving pieces ahead of time to make that decision for yourself. Right? Yeah. It's really hard to make a decision based on nothing like um I hate it when my husband comes home and he's like, what, what do you want for dinner? I, I don't know. I don't know. If you could just give me three options, that would be super helpful because my brain is fried by now. I'm done. I'm done. Just give me three options. Chinese, Indian, Japanese, just pick one. Um, So it's, it's that perspective where you need that, 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 um, am I on the right track? Are these numbers right? Am, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Like, is, is this correct? And it might be the case that, um, you know, you have a lot of cash sitting in the bank, but a lot of it's already spoken for, but you don't have a system to see that it's already, that it already has a job. Mm-hmm. That happens actually quite a bit in the interior design world. Um, and in the architect, anytime that you, you're getting prepaid for work, that can happen too, that you get upside down on, on the money coming in. Um, 
so it's nice to have that somebody who has your back can say, actually, did you consider this this other direction um, before you go down that road? Just to make sure that you have all all the chips on the table, all the ducks in a row before you pull a trigger. You know, speaking of being aware of the numbers and, and tracking the numbers, there, there have been several questions and comments about uh, different softwares, you know, uh, different systems to use uh, that, that are good for small businesses or, or sole practitioners. Do you have a preference when it comes to how people are tracking anything? Not really. Um, I ran my business on an Excel sheet and pivot tables for the first five, six years. That's fine. I have I come across people who are using that. It's I'm pretty system agnostic as long as you can see, right? That's that's the caveat. If you know how to run your pivot tables and make that income statement in a jiffy and and you know like you're using the profit first method so you can see what your cash is spoken for and what's not, um, fantastic. That's great. But if you need a little bit more disciplined approach, whether it's fresh books or whether it's QuickBooks or BQE Core, Team Excel, Chris, yeah. <laughs> Um, what's going to work for you, uh, and making sure that it's at least at a tempo. It doesn't have to be every month. I look at my books every six months. It doesn't have to be, but there has to be some sort of touch base of, I am on track. I am doing okay. And things aren't falling off the rails. So what are the, whether it's Excel or BQE core, you know, whatever the, whatever the, the preferred, um, software is, what are the most important numbers for small business owners to be paying attention to on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis? Uh, that's okay. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Your cash Cash is always king, but the cash on your balance sheet is not actually all your cash. The profit on your income statement is not actually cash. So, so truly, I don't mean to like beat the (laughs) profit first, profit first, profit first, but you got to know how much is yours and how much is spoken for. That's like straight up number one and how much is yours? How long is it going to last for? Um, The other things are more like hints. When it comes to, you know, those expenses for being a two person firm might be getting a little out of hand. Let's let's run a challenge and see if we can knock out 10 percent of those in an afternoon. Um, It's it goes back to how is your business serving you? And maybe those expenses are fun. Maybe you are having a ball in your business and you love the way that those expenses are like letting you live your life inside of your business. Fantastic. Great. I'm not going to come after them then as long as everything else is functioning. Right. But if you are taking out a bunch of loans that you don't have any way to pay back and you're racking up credit card debt and, da, 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 and sure it's fun, but somebody's going to have to pay the piper after a while. Um, it's going to take a more intense look. So I'm not going to pick out a number on your financial statements to look at other than know how much is yours and know how much is somebody else's. Hmm. Are there, you know, sp- speaking of the, how much is, somebody else's are there some of some really common people or or pipers that we've eventually got to pay that are often overlooked i mean we talked about subscriptions i think that's that's pretty easy right um what are small business owners small firm architects designers etc um what are we overlooking a lot Anything that's habitual, anything that's always been there. So it's there because it's always been there. Um, Whether it's your marketing, you know, a lot of people in in smaller towns, they've always run the ad in the local paper because they like to support the local paper. Um, But if you can't afford to support the local paper, you might need to stop running those $500 a month ads. Um, That's the place to look. The place that you don't want to look, that's where you go digging. Yeah, that, that. (laughs) <laughs> the place that no you don't want to look. Don't know <laughs> sacred cows. It's just challenging everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the um, I, I, and again, I, I, 
I'm stuck on this idea. Apologies to everybody, but I'm coming back to this idea. Um, you know, what's this business capable of? I think that's, again, I may, maybe I'm projecting. Isn't my that own fun? Here, but... Isn't that a fun exercise yeah. though? Like what is it capable it is. of? If we were to, if we were to pull this lever and push that one up, if we were to take our pricing here and we were going to get strict on how many revisions that we're willing to do before we start, you know, billing for extra time, like what would actually happen? Um, if we were to just take a blanket, psh, 20% cut on our expenses and just hold our nose and actually get it done. Like, what does that actually do? What, what would we get to do if we were able to achieve that? And um, I think there's some inspiration and motivation where the things that you haven't really pulled the trigger on yet, you're kind of nervous about. Once you're able to see that long-term effect, it becomes an easier decision of, all right, I'm in, let's do it. Let's do the thing. Or the other way, like uh, uh, I, I was... <laughs> I'm very much a, that sounds like a super interesting like program and I want in, I want to see what's on the inside and see the guts and gore of it. Uh, I needed something to talk me off the ledge and having that discipline of actually, Megan, you have your next three experiments that you run already laid out. These are your next three. You can put it on the list, but let's, let's hit these three. Did you want to knock those top three off the top of the list? We can, but you know, one of them's going to have to go so you can replace it with this, this, this other experiment. Um, yeah, I forget what your question was, but that's where my head went. <laughs> <laughs> well, but <laughs> that's all right. I, I don't even know what if there was even a question to be yeah. honest. But, um, but but as I'm thinking about it, two two weeks ago, we I think it was we talked with Ian Motley from Blue Turtle Consulting, and um, one of the things that he he he, he focuses on uh, um, basically fee strategies. And a big component, whether it's Ian Motley or if it's Blair with when we're pitching manifesto, there's there's lots of different versions and different people talking about this, but talking about three tier proposal. And one of the things that strikes me about this conversation and the conversation with Ian is, man, if I really think about what's this business capable of and those levers that you're talking about. And then apply that to the three tiers. What do I really want to do? You know, a three-tier proposal, I think a lot of us are going, okay, well, here's the top tier and it's got the biggest scope in it. And here's the middle one. It's got a little less scope. And here's the lowest one that's that's sort of like, you know, permit set or whatever. The the minimum, the you know, the minimum that, that supports a um, professional service. If I, if I change that to what do I really want to do, you know, and mesh that with what you're talking about and, and you're, you're talking about business, but I'm talking, okay, what is this business capable of? What do I really want to do with it? How about we put that into everything that we do? How do, how about we put that into our proposals and say, you know what? I hate doing that. Great. Let's don't put it in a, in one of those tiers. I really love doing that. Let's put that in one of those tiers. And I have somebody um, for you that can take care of that one thing that I don't want to do. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of power in that question that you ask. Is that, yeah. is that crunching numbers right there? <laughs> that's, I forgot. It. We're, we're supposed Usually, to start with that question. When I think of crunching numbers, I, th I think of people trying to manipulate their numbers to make it work anyway, because they've already made the decision. Oh, Okay. <laughs> The decisions been made. They're just looking point. for the cash to do it. <laughs> okay, I know that. I know about that kind of thing. All right. Yeah, yeah. Just making the numbers work, basically. Yeah, make it work. Make it work. Yeah. I think that's actually the code name for the new serial that General Mills is about to release. <laughs> Crunching the numbers, as opposed yeah. to uh, sharpening your pencil. That just means like getting more precise numbers, right? Ooh. Is that what is that what that one means? Yeah, yeah. G digging in and yeah, sure. I buy it. I, I have clients who say that a lot. Pencils. Perhaps you'd like to sharpen your pencil. Like, yeah. Okay. Sharpen. I don't even sharpen. use a pencil. Sharp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have an Apple pencil. Sharpen that. <laughs> don't don't um, put that in the pencil sharpener. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. This is all very, um, this is all very inspiring. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Like numbers, numbers can suck. I think we're culturally, uh, so told math is hard and boring and all of the things and it can be some drudgery and it's hard to sit down and get your books done. Um, but if you're like looking at it for what's in it for me, because so much of it is compliance, 
reporting, taxes, blah, blah, blah. But if you have the perspective of what's in it for me, what what do I get to do um, because of what I've learned? I think it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's a, I think that's a really excellent point, right? You're, you're, again, going back to the very beginning, you're giving meaning to all of these, to all of these numbers and all of these things that we're considering, which obviously I'm stuck on this idea, but I think that's the reason that a lot of the people in this audience um, started their businesses, right? There's a reason it's supporting their lifestyle, their family, their desire to work 80 hours a week instead of 70 hours a week or work 40 hours a week instead of 80 hours a week or spend more time with their kids or travel or whatever that that to me is is where it meshes up with the you know there's meaning behind all of these all of these levers that you're going to pull and all the lines on the excel spreadsheet and um and all of that yeah if anybody else has found this inspiring and I'm pretty sure there's a couple that have, there's a good, there's a healthy conversation, side conversation going on there in the comments. And there's a couple of sisters arguing back and forth a little bit, or <laughs> at least bantering back and forth. Um, Megan is also going to be a speaker at the Entree Architect Community Annual Meeting, which is our first ever conference, live conference for just for small firm entrepreneur architects. November 1st through 3rd in Austin, Texas. Um, that That's how Megan and I first got to talk was last week. I interviewed her for the Meet the Speaker series. Um, so if this if you found this inspiring and you want to know more, go to entrearchitect.com slash annual meeting and, and uh, sign up. Sign up for the conference. You can meet Megan in person. Be it's going to be so fun. I have my business partner. She's coming now too. I got her to get her plane ticket yesterday too. So oh, awesome. Yeah, awesome. that'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. It it really will be. There's a great speaker lineup again, entrearchitect.com slash annual meeting. You'll find out all about the conference, November first through third in Austin. Uh, but you'll find out about all the speakers as well and and uh, obviously Megan and uh, information on on her talk is on that page oh. as well. I know that you have several offerings on your website, Megan, which by the way is megandolly.com, M-E-G-A-N-D-A-H-L-E.com. I'll put that in the lower left here in just a minute. But um, there, there, there are maybe five five uh, offerings there on your website. What what are one or the t- one or two of the things that um, that people really need to think about taking advantage of? Uh, you know, if you are anywhere near like considering hiring somebody, hiring for profit is a li- really um, inexpensive way to like work through that. Like, should I, shouldn't I exercise? And otherwise, I um, actually don't really like to put people through it until they like make an appointment. There's a link right there where we can chat for 15 minutes and I can tell you what would be the best route for you because um, everybody's in a different boat and I don't yeah. want to steer you wrong. I love that. It's that's that's one of the great things and one of the most frustrating things about having conversations like this. We were we were talking about this this morning. Code comes up, business entities come up, licensure comes up. You know, there's certain um, uh, um, errors and omissions. Our insurance, all, all those all those things come up, and the answer to everything ultimately is it depends. It depends. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. So, um, but talk to Megan. MeganDolly.com, the uh, URL is in the bottom left corner of your screen right now. Um, as, as you can tell, this, this, is not, uh, this is not boring. This is not, um, you know, it's not something to be feared. I think you have a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, Megan. we have and fun. <laughs> <laughs> maybe even eat some ice cream or some nachos. Who knows? <laughs> Um, Megan, thanks a lot for joining us for this conversation today. It was fantastic. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. This was really fun. And uh, and thanks for being part of our community. Again, uh, Megan is no stranger to the Entree Architect community. Uh, she's got a, a whole bunch of friends here from the uh, Architects and Allies Mastermind Group that uh, she's part of. And um, and <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot of great banter going going on there. So. Um, Thank you to everybody out there. Of course, Catherine, thank you for co-hosting this conversation with me today. Uh, Next week, 
if I click over to this tab, it'll tell me that next week, our guest for Context and Clarity Live will be Ray Brown. He's over in Australia. Well, he's from Archibiz. So we'll talk with Ray next week about uh, marketing, uh, g- generally about marketing and business development for architects. So um, I will announce more about that on Saturday as usual. And you tell me what you want to talk about next week uh, for all of our Context and Clarity conversations. But um, until then, we will continue talking about finances for your firm and our question tomorrow, both on Clubhouse at 9 a.m. Eastern and tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern for a Context and Clarity conversation inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. The question for tomorrow is, what are you doing to increase your profitability? So that's what we'll talk about tomorrow. It'll flow right out of this conversation today. Hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> hopefully <right? laughs> i say that so positively yeah <laughs> that is absolutely what's going to happen mm-hmm. we'll see we'll, we'll see. see how it goes um thanks everybody thank you for this opportunity for this conversation thanks for making context and clarity a thing because without you we would not have had the opportunity to have this conversation with megan today so how did okay we don't it's know. time to wrap this up and i'm I have no idea how John Jones did that. Um, Australia. Yes, down under. Okay, I get it. I don't know how you did that. Mm. We're going to need a tutorial. I think it's um, <laughs> it's a span. It's a foreign language keyboard. So it's like upside down question mark. Well, anyway, we don't want to get, get distracted. Get distracted. Sorry. I, I, I think you just turn it upside down and type it. I don't know. Anyway, with that, thanks, everybody. Appreciate all of you. Please take care of yourselves. Be well, stay safe. Take a little bit of time to breathe, relax, find a way to rejuvenate. We do this every day. It's a long game. Thanks for playing the game with us. Thanks for going along the journey with us. And um, hope we'll see you somewhere sometime soon. Thanks, everybody.